together to talk about all the things we used to do. The laughs, the passions, the little Sebastians, the pets we fell into. And we're putting it all in a podcast, then we'll send it up into the sky. We're calling it Parks and Recollection. Come on, little podcast, spread your wings and fly. Welcome, everyone, to Parks and Recollection. It's yours truly, Robert J. Love. What was the the name that that Mike Sure came up? Rob Bocephius Lowe. Bocephius. Bocephius. Robert Bocephius Lowe. I think he would introduce you sometimes as Robert Bocephius Lowe. And what would your phony name, if it weren't Alan Yang, which it is, and I'm happy for it, what would it be? Uh, Sebastian. Sebastian. Uh, oh, well, and it's the perfect episode for it. <laughs> it is Parks and Recollection, and this is the Harvest Festival episode, the legendary Harvest Festival episode. Legendary for so many reasons, which we will get into. So pull up a chair, turn the treadmill down, whatever you're doing, because this is a very special episode. Yeah, man. Listen carefully. Legends only. Legends only this episode. Harvest Festival. I mean, classic. It's on a lot of people's top 10, top 5, top 1 lists. Yep. Um, uh, really, really great episode. Season 3, episode 7. The culmination. The finale of the Harvest Festival arc. Which began with the first episode, of course. Written by Dan Gore. Directed by Dean Holland. Original air date March 17th, 2011. On the day before the Harvest Festival, a local Native American leader places a curse on the event because Leslie refuses to give in to his demands. And curses in quotes because obviously it's made up and that's not real, but it's the kickoff, the inciting incident to the episode. Um, nope, no, it's number one. No Rob Lowe in this episode. So you can mm. speak freely. He'll return in the next episode camping. Um, as, as you guys have hopefully heard in the last episode of Indianapolis, he broke up with Anna Perkins. He's in Indianapolis, and we don't know if he's coming back to the show, but he is, and he'll return for 70 more episodes, but he's not in this one. Second nope's note, when Leslie recounts how the town is so superstitious, they burned a traveling magician at the stake for pulling a rabbit out of a hat in 1973. A closer look at the mural reveals that the town also executed the rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very good joke. Zoom in on that, guys. Pause on that. Pause on that. If you're on your laptop, zoom in. Um, it's a very funny kind of tiny visual joke. Um, the book that Ron is reading at the Harvest Festival is called The Nutmeg of Constellation by Patrick O'Brien, the 14th book of the series from which the film Master and Commander, The Far Side of the World, was drawn. Hang on. Hang Please, on. Go ahead. We may have a Ray Donovan moment. It's absolutely here. Ray Donovan. It's exactly what I was going to say. This is why we do the pod together. If you didn't listen to the last episode, we, we we named some shows that are like your uncle's favorite shows, or or your your aunt or your niece or someone in your life, but you're not they're not your favorite shows. Ford vs Ferrari was mentioned, uh, and and uh, well, I think Hope you actually floats. have to say four V Ferrari. Ford v Ferrari. Was I think mentioned. that's the key to that. Yes. Uh, Rizzoli and Isles was mentioned. Anyway, Master and Commander is a great Ray Donovan. <laughs> great Master one. Master and Commander. Because like, when was the last time you thought about Master and Commander? <laughs> like, it, it, it's not a bad movie. It's good, in fact. It's just, it's in that ether. It's in that milieu. So, great call. Yeah. Uh, a lot of nope's notes on this one, of course. Big episode. Yeah. Number four, due to budget constraints, we didn't have the production build out the entire Harvest Festival and Corn Maze sets. Instead, this is fascinating, we filmed the episode at the annual Halloween Harvest Festival at L.A. Pierce College. So it lined up. Now, was that really the Halloween? I guess it was. It looked hot as hell out there. I got to say, this was Halloween. This is Halloween. Man, it looked it looked pretty hot out there. Well, it's really hot in Los Angeles in October. <laughs> yeah, I October, guess right. <laughs> October is actually it is the hottest month. It's super hot. It is always the hottest month in L.A. Uh, number five, the episode was filmed out of sequence. It was filmed ninth in the order, though it airs as the seventh. This was so the weather would be cooler when the scenes were shot. Look at that. The notes eh. notes coinciding with our with our uh, uh, the topic of conversation. Number six, the episode was screened for the media during an NBC press junket in January 2021. Is that right? That's got to be wrong. 2020. Uh, 
2011. <laughs> okay. 2011. All right. 2021. Man, guys, uh, got any new shows? You going to just show a Parks and Rec up? Okay. <laughs> hey, didn't want to show Keenan? <laughs> okay, by right. the way, by the way, the way things are going, that that might be true. Hey, man. It's a, hey, we got a reboot of Parks and Rec. Wait a minute. Yeah. That's just an old episode. Yeah, you caught yeah. us. <laughs> okay. After reporters got a tour of the Parks and Rec set, and we're able to pose for photos with a miniature horse who played Little Sebastian. We're going to go off on Little Sebastian later. Oh, yes. So save your fire. Speaking of Little Sebastian, this episode is his first appearance. It is also, sadly, his penultimate appearance, second to last appearance. So basically, there's two of him. Side note, he will be a hologram at one point. Spoiler alert for people who are waiting for him to be a hologram. He, he is a hologram later. Say, he was a hologram before... Um, Tupac? Tupac. Was he, or was that written after Tupac? I actually, I'm not sure. <laughs> was it not inspired by the Tupac hologram? I don't know, actually. I got. I literally just read a piece on Coachella. What, what year was the Tupac hologram at Coachella? Mm. I'm looking it up right now, guys. This is riveting we'll podcasting. Um, I just, uh, it looks like 2012. Tupac, Snoop, Dr. Dre. They could have brought him back for the Super Bowl, to be honest. I wouldn't have been mad at that. Maybe a Biggie hologram, too. All yeah, right, totally. let's get into the synopsis. With the Harvest Festival, days away. Leslie surprises everyone by booking Lil Sebastian, a miniature horse and legendary Pawnee celebrity. Everyone is thrilled except Ben, who doesn't understand the fascination. The chief of the local Wamapoke tribe, Ken Hotate, played by Jonathan Joss, visits the parks department and requests his Harvest Festival be moved as it's built upon the site of a Wamapoke massacre. When Leslie explains it's too late, Ken warns them the festival may become cursed, although he privately tells the documentary crew that he knows why people are terrified of curses. So it's pretty much a bit. Okay, so th- what you've just described for me might be the funniest, like pound for pound, second for second, minute for minute experience in all of Parks and Recreation. <laughs> it's I mean, up I, there. It's I'm, up there. I am not in it. So here's here's okay. So I realized I'm like, why have I not seen? Here's what happened. I'm not in the episode, so I didn't read it. And then when I look back on when it aired. I'm like, why have I not seen it? And realized it aired on my birthday, March 17th, <laughs> 2011. I was doing other things than yep. watching television. So I, in prepping for this was the first time I've actually seen. I love it. The famous Harvest Festival. And can I just tell you, it surpasses anything that I had heard about it. That's this amazing. Episode, this episode is sheer genius from beginning to end. That's great. And I think, you know, Rob always likes the sort of comedy forward episodes. And I think this is not only comedy forward, but it encapsulates and crystallizes and is the essence of so many elements of the show coming together, right? It, it's it's not only the hard comedy, it's the group coming together, it's Ben and Leslie, it's the town, right? It's the media, mm-hmm. it's all of these peripheral tertiary characters who yep. pop in and get two great lines, one great scene. Um, no, it, it really is the the apotheosis of all those things coming together. And a, a few, a little bit of background on Little Sebastian. I know I mentioned, actually, not even related to Little Sebastian, that my middle fake middle name would be Sebastian. All of the writers had fake names on the show. I don't know why we did this. My fake name on the show was Sebastian. So like Chelsea Peretti was Kim, I think. Harris Whittles was Lou. I think Aisha was Daisy. I mean, this is insane. I don't know why we did this, but everyone had a fake name, and my fake name was Sebastian. I don't know how that tied in, but I also remember very distinctly the the origin of Lil Sebastian the horse was because there was it was a real news story. And and I actually dug up the emails. I had emails from that time. This is from April 25th, 2010. There's an email I sent to Mike Schur, Dan Gore, Aisha Muhar, Kitty Dippold, Emily Spivey. Subject line, I will click on any link, subject or body, dot, 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 that asks the question, is he the world's smallest horse? And it's a link <laughs> to a CNN video. And it's called The Smallest Horse in the World. And I, the, the end of the email says, his name is Einstein. And the, 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 the email chain continues. Aisha writes back, terrifying. Kitty Dippold <laughs> write back, writes back, that's a cat, I'll tell them. And then, <laughs> and then in 2010, I wrote back, I, don't, I guess I remember this episode, and I said, our tiny horse idea from eight years ago would later turn into a week-long, multi-million dollar production involving hundreds of extras, a tribute video, rock music, and a giant fa- fireball. What a show. The CNN link still works and includes the phrase, for now, he's just busy being cute. So, so, so that is... 
literally emails from that day or around when we were pitching the episode. And um, uh, th- that second episode I sent was uh, when we were kind of finishing it, right? So it was, it was it's 2010, right? Yeah. Little Sebastian has to be, has to be, out of all of the peripheral things about Parks and Rec and the Parks and Rec universe, has to be the most famous. It's it's got to be up there, and and it's also like it works with fucking Ben, right? It's Ben's oh. new to the town. It's a it's a great metaphor. It's a kind of a metaphor for him learning the the town's weirdness, right? He's so funny with his whole. It's a little horse. I don't I don't get it. <laughs> it just makes it's it's it is literally like um, it it is like a softball pitch right down the middle of the plate of Adam Scott's sweet spot to play that move, that comedy move. I would also say it is a great use of the mockumentary conceit because he's able to share his true feelings with us, the audience, essentially by tech, by talking directly to camera. Otherwise he doesn't have anyone else in the world to tell that to, you know, because he doesn't have any, he doesn't have another outsider. You're not in this episode. So he's telling the viewer directly. So, uh, I would say that's a good use of the talking heads. Um, Jonathan Joss, uh, who who plays Ken Hotate, previously voiced John Redcorn in the animated television series King of the Hill, which was co-created by Parks and Rec co-creator Greg Daniels. Um, and I remember this. I remember this in the room. Ken Hotate's last name was made up. It's a. Uh, it's the word Hotate is the Japanese word for scallop. If you ever go to a sushi <laughs> bar, you'll see Hotate on the menu. It means scallop. And uh, in retrospect, maybe we should have made that up. But whatever. <laughs> That's what happened. He has one of the great talking heads. He goes, I know in my experience upon he has taught me that white people, white people like Rachel Ray and are terrified of curses is, yes. is one of my favorite. It's amazing. And I think there was an alt. If there's one thing I know about white people. It's that they love Matchbox 20 and they're terrified of curses. <laughs> so that was the other. By the way, it's very much in the vein of, again, yes. dare I say it. Ray Donovan. Ray Donovan. <laughs> this is becoming a real catch-up. This is becoming a real catch-up. Yes. Uh, and so uh, the other things, a couple notes from this section, basically. Uh, uh, Mike Schur said while writing about this curse, the writing staff wanted it to be the local media that turned it into an issue be- instead of the citizens of Pawnee because uh, they felt like it would be too cartoonish and unbelievable for the residents to really take the curse seriously. But... It's kind of something that the media in the town, which we've seen, is pretty silly. You know, we've seen a lot of media, you know, media figures. We've seen John Calamezzo. We've seen Pert Happily. We've seen, you know, Crazy Iron the Douche. Like, that's the kind of people who might gin this kind of thing up. And so, uh, you know, look, I think we're looking for external conflict. I think we're looking for challenges for Leslie. And so, um, this curse thing was really more of a PR thing, in, in essence. It wasn't that they actually believed in the curse. It was more like, oh, it's bad PR and no one will come to the Harvest Festival. I also like how in season three, we're worried about the citizens upon you worried about a curse but in season four we have a or five we have a whole episode based on the end of the world and everyone believing <laughs> that the cult was accurate about the end of the world so things change things you know what it, 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 a television show evolves and changes in lovely ways over the course of the run of the show <laughs> uh we talked to our friend dan gore and he said about the cold open uh when everyone meets lil sebastian a big turning point in breaking this story was realizing that everyone everyone including ron loved lil sebastian the moment of giddiness that Ron has in seeing Lil Sebastian is such a fun moment and a wonderful payoff for this unflappable, inscrutable character. It's the first time that you see him get truly nakedly emotional, and it's because he gets to meet this miniature horse. And that seems like that's what you were responding to, Rob, right? It's like, it's just the, it's the pure unbridled joy uh, of this little tiny mini horse. And everybody, I mean, like you said, in almost any other iteration of anything you could think of, when you have the gang together, someone is going to have a, count, a counter reaction to some other character. You know, usually it would be uh, April. Yeah. Right. She'd be the one to be like, eh, whatever. Yeah. Or whatever. And and they all love this horse, like every single person. And and so did America, as it turns out. That's the, <laughs> I put little Sebastian up as the most most beloved horse since uh, since what? International uh, Velvet? What, who would it even be? Sea biscuit, sea biscuit, <laughs> yeah, Mr. Ed, Secretariat, Mr. Ed. I mean, yeah, whatever, man. Yeah, <laughs> These Mr. are famous. Mr. We're just we're now just playing uh, ten thousand dollar pyramid. Famous yes. horses, <laughs> or, 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 or I, I guess it's family feud. Famous horses. Let's go. Famous horses. Famous horses. Uh, Bojack Horseman. Hey. 
Ann works at the Harvest Festival first aid tent where she confines in Donna that she has not taken the breakup with Chris well. Man, you ruined her, Chris. April tells Andy that she loves him but grows angry when he replies, Dude, shut up. That is awesome sauce. Legendary moment. Joan Calamato arrives to report on the festival and is determined to find a negative story, although she does show excitement over little Sebastian. She loves him, too. She initially fi- fails to find a scandal, but then overhears Leslie and Ben discussing the curse. It becomes the focus of her story, especially after Tom tells Leslie that little Sebastian escaped his pen. Tom blames Jerry, although it was entirely Tom's fault. So I'm a sucker for a, a horse escaping its pen uh, <laughs> stories. I... That I mean, my, one of my favorite songs ever is uh, we should put fair usage. We can probably play it in here. What's the song about the famous 70s yacht rock classic um, by Firefall? Um, Wildfire, the pony she named Wildfire, busted down his stall in a blizzard. He was lost and the horse dies. It's a very sad song. Was a number one Jeez. hit. One of my favorites. That's super sad. Very reminiscent of this little Sebastian story in this episode. I mean, thank God that doesn't happen, right? Thank God that doesn't happen. It was, uh, it was, it, look, it's also making use of the Jerry game in a very funny way. <laughs> like, Tom, what's Tom doing when he's, he's, is he on the phone or something? What is he doing when, when, uh, when little Sebastian escapes? He's going to talk about the Snake Hole Lounge. Oh, uh, he's um, promoting the Snake Hole Lounge, right? And he has that, so little Sebastian has that, uh, the, the the kind of jacket on too, right? What do they call it when the horse is wearing it? I'm just calling it a horse jacket, but <laughs> I I remember being on set for part of this too, because I remember when Little Sebastian came down to the Parks and Rec office, which obviously is a soundstage on the CBS Radford lot in Studio City. Um, but the writers went down, and I have like photos with Little Sebastian. <laughs> like, like it's I remember, like I, I it's it's very it's a time capsule photo. I'm like I remember the outfit. And I was wearing white vans, and I was like, yeah, this is this is it. But uh, I remember we're being on set for this a little bit. Um, one of the Harvest Festival booths features Pawnee celebrity Aunt Tilda, the fictional aunt of basketball player Larry Bird. I remember Joan Calamouse was very excited. You got Tilda? That's a great joke. Um, and Ron sits on a launcher. We talked about this. This is the the uh, Master and Commander book. <laughs> this is when I feel like that's a that's we talked about Ron liking Master and Commander like a lot. I think Nick actually loves this series, if I'm not mistaken. It's also there's a little Easter egg. It's on the uh, the poster for the Pyramid of Greatness. Besides all the real ones like honor and dignity and whatever uh, freedom, uh, one of them is old wooden sailing ships. So this yes. is all in character for Ron. Um, yeah. So uh, look, it's it's. Uh, also, the awesome sauce. So, I this is weird. I, it, maybe this was a blind spot for me, but I didn't really know the phrase awesome sauce when it came up in the writer's room. Is this a common, I guess, 10 years ago, was this a common phrase? Because it got pitched in the writer's room as if everyone knew that phrase. I guess it's a, a phrase for, First for of kids all, or something. I, there's nothing I hate more than <laughs> phrases that pop up and all of a sudden everybody is saying them like it's been going on since the beginning of time. <laughs> I was, you, fu- I, yeah, I was, I was shaking. I didn't know what this was. It's Strong Bad, the character from Home Star Runner, what? which was a animated short series um, by brothers Mike and Matt Chapman in the early two thousands. Home Star Runner? That's a that's a deep pull, man. It sounds like I just described a fever dream again. I like when we come up with categories of things, like you know, uh, it, like we did with the Ray Donovans for specific types of movies. We need to do it for phrases because. Right under awesome sauce for me would be amaze balls. Yeah, I, that stuff. I don't me like crazy, any man. of that stuff. Get out of here with amaze balls, awesome <laughs> sauce, and get out <laughs> all of it. I feel like I think there's a there's a show called Workaholics that was on Comedy Central, and I think the, in their writers' room, I'm pretty sure it was their writers' room, they had a whiteboard where it was like every like hack comedy phrase. It's, yes. it's adjacent to this. It's not like yes. a hack. I'm not saying awesome sauce is a hack phrase because it's not really a joke. Right. But it, but on this board, it was hack stuff. It was the cliched stuff like, you know, that went well, like that kind of stuff. Like, yes. please. Like that kind of stuff. That's like, going to oh, hurt. Yeah, that's got to hurt. I'm okay. Like see, someone get hit, <laughs> gets hit by something. It's in the trailer. I'm okay. Like that kind of shit. Yes, <laughs> like, yes. You're like, like another thing was, another thing, by the way, this is in that category that yeah, Harris yeah. Whittle specifically talked about was in a movie trailer when somebody was about to say a curse word like, Oh my God, holy. And then they cut out. And then yes. he's like, he once tweeted, like, I love when this happens in a movie when someone's about to say a curse <laughs> word. 
got to watch the movie, see if they say the word. <laughs> it's like, what are we doing here? Like, come on, man. This is not, this is not funny or interesting. Anyway, apologies to movie trailer cutters. And, you know, the, 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 but the ultimate of all of them would be the needle scratch. Yes, that's, a, that's, that's it, yes, needle scratch. The worst and that's been ever. going on for decades. They're still doing it. They're still They're doing still it. Still doing it's it. It's the so, worst uh, thing. It's the worst. It's a war crime. Just a little little note out to writers, creators, directors, whoever, uh, 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 try to avoid that shit. <laughs> try to avoid <laughs> it in your writing because it's it's painful. Well, it's painful. I'll get, we, we, what about promo departments? Uh, yeah. Promo I mean, that's departments. A whole if thing. you're listening, if you work in a promo department, if you're cutting movie trailers, I'm begging you. Don't do any more. I can't wait to see. Wait, what's going over there? <laughs> you don't slip, drop, scratch. Yuck. You would you would think they would stop doing. It. I mean, it's 2022. We're we're way way back. Like a lot of shit has happened. Like, can we stop using these old cliches and tropes and movie trailers? It's all I ask. That's all uh, we ask. All right. Synopsis continues. The Pawnee Media swarms the festival to cover the curse, endangering its opening the next day with a bad press. With one reporter likening Ben's past as a failed teen mayor with a curse. Now believing himself to be the curse, Ben leaves the festival. As Leslie assures the reporters there is no curse, the power generator blows out, leaving the festival dark and stranding most of the parks department on a Ferris wheel. Using the blackout as an excuse, Anne takes Donna's advice to make out with Kylie, Joey Russo, her dumb but attractive patient. I leave for one second and look what goes on. <laughs> I mean, by, by the way, like you got to... I, I, God bless Joey Russo. Some questionable choice uh, decision making. Some questionable decision making for man here. Like this character, I don't know. Made me laugh. Like I don't know what we're doing with this character. He's like a Jersey Shore guy. Is that what's going on? Do you remember this, Greg? Writing this character, I remember very vividly. All of us in the writers' room watching the casting videos and the debate yes. being what type of a guy it should be, right? And some people really loved this yes. voice and this take. Yes. And some people like, this isn't someone we naturally find in Pawnee. Yes. So maybe that didn't matter because it was more about who's the type of guy that would it. both yeah. be someone and would never want to see again, but also want to hook up with. And so much time was spent thinking about the nuance yeah. of who this random hookup should be. <laughs> I I think it, I think the wrong choice was made. This took me out of the episode a little. Rob, what did you think? It, what, it, what do you think of this guy? He's like a New York. He's like a he's like a New York guy or something. I got yes, totally. Yes. I'd say I was totally taken out of the episode by, yes! by that character. I, I was. I, why is he talking like that? That's what, what is he doing? Just cast just cast like a a normal corn fed like football player type guy or something who's like dumb or something. I mean, like just do just someone who would be in. In this guy, where do we find this actor? Sorry, I'm sorry to this actor. You're just trying to work. I get it, but this is it was more of a, a writing casting choice. But I remember arguing. We watched the tapes. We're like, no, don't cast this guy. And then he got cast anyway. Well, he 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 does the role well, but in a very unexpected way. I sometimes have found now I like to look up where uh, other these actors we've cast, what else they've done. I'm just curious. And he's in Jersey Boys, the movie. And of course, he's yes. in Jersey Boys, the movie. Yes. Right? No. Is he in Pawnee, Indiana? I don't know. <laughs> I that, that That's what it was remembering. I was remembering the sense memory of arguing about this character, who I guess is named Kylie, who is a hot but attractive patient. A hot but dumb patient, I guess. But uh, anyway, the rare Donna and C story, which is, <laughs> I love that, <laughs> which is like Donna giving and dating advice. Um yeah, this was a fun episode. Like, like we mentioned earlier about uh, Purd, uh, Shauna, and Joan, they end up being really important to the show because ultimately we we realized we recalibrated the show so that there was less internal conflict. Although, of course, there's conflict between our characters, but there's often like they, they're a team against the rest of the world. So to do that, I think you need exterior external conflict. You need external antagonists, and the media was natural. Like there's in in Harvest Festival, they're kind of the antagonists, not just in this episode, but also in the Media Blitz episode, right? So it's like there's just so it's just useful to have these characters put the screws on and, and sort of tighten the vise on on our gang. Well and also because those two characters are also, as you say, I love the hard comedy. I love yes. it. And 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 you know, um I prefer it even over story. And um, those actors and those characters are killer. Per what is Perd saying this? Um, 
the, this this reporter's statement is a question or whatever they <laughs> yeah yeah I yeah mean, yeah exactly yeah I mean just again maybe the most char- fun character to write for like Bird was just like it's every line is a joke and it just every line makes me laugh it just it's just hilarious delivery and and shout out to Joan as well like Joan is like okay as time went on we just made her a more and more like just a mess, just a walking. Mess. I, at a certain point, Tom Haverford walks up to her, Joan, you look great. Did you get your breast done? She's like, thank you for noticing. Yes. It's like, this is insane. This is just an insane couplet of dialogue. Like what is happening in the show? You know, something else I think we should talk about just briefly. I'm curious to get both your takes is this moment where Ben believes he's the curse and he decides yeah. to leave. It's such an interesting choice, I think, because We've spent so much time um, uh, uh, with Ben being this visitor from outside helping. But this felt almost like, you know, uh, something that someone who's worked with them forever and feels like he's at home here. He's so invested in the Harvest Vessel at this point. So, you know what I mean? Like, did, didn't it feel a bit like he, oh, he's one of us. He's one of the community now. Well, here's what I thought is, as, as a true outsider, as someone who's not in the episode and who hadn't seen it until about two hours ago, um, I thought that 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 Ben's thinking he was the curse and leaving was just an homage to the nutmeg of consolation by Patrick <laughs> O'Brien, which was later made into the movie uh, Master and Commander. Because in Master and Commander, there is that famous sequence where there's the jinx that puts them in the doldrums mm. and the jinx grabs a cannonball in one of the most disturbing scenes in movies and commits suicide by jumping over the ship, holding a cannonball plummeting to the depths see i felt this was just an elaborate nod to that wow when's the last time you, when's the last time you watched master and commander that's an incredible recall of that movie <laughs> i could have watched that this morning and not remembered that <laughs> i'm telling you i'm a big master and commander guy i mean secretly it turns out it's not just your uncle's favorite show it's your favorite movie like but I, like, I wouldn't <laughs> have watched it if he was just the master the fact that he's the master and the commander i was like well this guy's I'm going to see Russell Crowe in this. That really seals the deal. It's a it's an amazing, uh, amazing title. By the way, Nutmeg of Consolation, also an amazing title. That's I thought, really... When I started reading that, I thought it was a joke that we had written because it's so funny. <laughs> Nutmeg of Consolation. Also, we've talked about these Ray Donovan movies, these Ray Donovan so he's Master Commander was nominated for ten Oscars. I think it's worth <laughs> calling out. <laughs> that's, okay. Well, that's the thing. That, that's the thing. Like, it, it's a pretty broad category at this point because uh, Ford v Ferrari also nominated for like a shit ton of Oscars. Uh, so. <laughs> I'm sorry, I I have the ignominious honor of losing an award to someone on fucking Ray Donovan. So <laughs> okay. let's just fucking yeah. get real, guys. I lost the Golden Globe to um, John Voight. For, oh wow! For Ray yeah. Donovan, so John awards the, don't mean you know awards don't inoculate you I, I, from I not being in the Ray Donovan <laughs> silo. <laughs> absolutely, you. you're absolutely. By the way, and John Voight, what is so he's Ray Donovan's dad, right? Can he's we, Ray can Donovan's we, dad. Can yep. we get a what's his character's name? Now we're just into Ray Donovan minutia, but, <laughs> I, but I just want to know what his name is because I, I just want to know his characters. Oh man, we got Mickey some bad actually, Donovan. Mickey Donovan. Okay. Of course Mickey. it's Mickey. Mickey Donovan. Uh, okay, let's get back to the synopsis. On the Ferris wheel, with April and Andy arguing below him and Tom and Jerry arguing above him, an annoyed Ron clears the air by announcing the obvious. April is mad at Andy for not telling her that he loves her back. And the missing little Sebastian is Tom's fault. Andy tells April that he clearly loves her and they hug and Tom apologizes to Jerry. Later, everyone spots Lil Sebastian in the corn maze and they recover him. Leslie learns the power outage was due to television crews plugging into the grid and overloading it. The only replacement generator in Pawnee is at the Wamapoke Casino, and Leslie humbly asks Ken to loan it to her in exchange for placing a Wamapoke cultural exhibit near the Harvest Festival entrance. Ken agrees, and during the festival opening the next morning, he performs a meaningless ceremony to remove the fake curse. Wow. A lot of plot, and it's like, it all ties together. It's all tying together. And it's funny. It's yes. all funny and and uh jonathan joss very funny actor um very funny actor in this in this show really funny in this he super did a great job. super funny i love and his voice it's his just like voice a, is great it's a cool and, voice and his vest is great he's wearing yes. a wonderful wonderful vest shout out to our costume department kirsten mann still working with her doing my new show great great costume designer um yeah this is uh this is a producer note this episode's a perfect example of punching up 
It could have been all the murals and the town used to be bad, but we do see the town actively working to better itself. That's true. That's actually true. It's, it's still had a long way to go with the help of Leslie. Um, I, I, there's just a couple uh, Andy jokes that I wanted to shout out that I really enjoyed. Uh, he's playing the carnival game where he's throwing like a ring toss game where he's throwing rings, I think, and he, he keeps messing up and he's like, it's almost like they don't want you to win. <laughs> which I thought was very funny. And then uh, and then he's in the corn maze and he says, this maze is like a maze. <laughs> it's like a cra- <laughs> just crazy jokes. I mean, like these jokes are funny and also Pratt very funny delivering them. Um, but yeah, very, very funny. Oh, wow. This ma- uh, here's okay. I've, someone's typing in the Google Doc right now. This maze is like a maze and they added an eye to the first maze. Oh, boy. Schulte making a little pun. I love the, the real time uh, wordplay happening. Yeah. Um. Yeah, and by the way, this Pert Happily joke is also in the notes. Pert Happily says, yes, the statement that this reporter has is a question. <laughs> God, it's so good. <laughs> so there you go. There you go. Um, uh, oh, b- oh, by the way, the exterior shot of the casino says uh, Rachel Ray, which is a, a callback to... <laughs> uh, I'm uh, unclear what she's doing. Is she uh, doing a cooking demonstration? Is she, <laughs> is she, is she, is she doing a concert? Like, what's, what's Rachel Ray doing there? Signing a book? She's gambling. Yeah, I guess she's just in there gambling. You know, um, I remember Dan Gore talking about uh, being really impressed with this, uh, well, in general with Dean Holland as a director, but this choice and the way lighting and directing, everything came together, that moment where they spot little Sebastian in the maze, right? The way that the light is kind of like shimmering off of that horse jacket, which we don't actually, I think, know the actual term for still. <laughs> yes, the horse called jacket. Called horse jacket that he almost like gets lit up like this angelic thing in the middle of the maze, like furthering the lore of the greatness of little Sebastian, such a smart directing choice um, that maybe can get, go unnoticed, but I think it was uh, wonderful. Yeah. And shout out to Dean too. Cause, yeah. cause he had like, you know, we had him as a guest listen to his episode of this podcast as well, but his first episode obviously was uh, I think Sweetums the, the year before, I think it was episode 10 or something like that season two, which was an episode that I had the writing credit on and, and, and was on set with him with. And by this time, he had already become a pretty confident, solid director, and he would become the most frequent director of the show. I think this episode was a big reason why, because it came out so well. And, and him and Dan were a great team, because Dan ended up being, he wasn't quite yet the number two on the show, I think, at this point, but uh, maybe close to it. And, and uh, he ended up being kind of the second command for a while on, on Parks. So um, a really good team. And uh, yeah, Dean killed this episode. Visually, Dean was, it's um, great. I, I, we, we were blessed to have really good directors. Directors. We never had a bad director, and, and and that's that's so rare on television. Yeah, and and we did so many episodes. Every director was was wonderful, but uh, Dean was my favorite. I think Dean, D, I think Dean was the best director we had in and, throughout. I think he was and amazing. He, and 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 part of that is because he just has this deep understanding of the show. That's something yep. like I, I kind of learned after you know directing for a while it's like part of your job you know there's all this stuff you can do with directing actors blocking and your lenses and all lighting and all this shit. but like really you need a deep 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 within your bones understanding of the story understanding of the characters understanding what the show is and what the sort of vision of the show is and because dean was an editor and had he had literally seen more footage of the show than any human being on earth Right. So it's like he understands what yep. worked in the show. He understands the pieces that he needed. He understands how it comes together in post because he ran the post department. Like he ran the post. He watched the show with Mike more than anybody. And so, uh, you know, he ended up, and, and also like, you know, he's a good communicator. So he ended up being a great director for it. So shout out to Dean on this one. You know, Dean also worked at The Office, right, with Greg and Mike yes, before. Yes, that's so right. He just knew this style of comedy and storytelling so well. And I looked it up, his credits, he will have go, gone on to direct 27 episodes of Parks and Rec. It's, <laughs> he, he directed one-fifth or more of all Parks episodes. It's incredible. That's, it's staggering. It's staggering. And he's gone on to do a lot of other great stuff. So shout out to Dean. Um, I think he was Parks the first thing he directed. He might have done one episode of The Office or something. Anyway, uh We'll fact check that later. People begin to swarm into the festival to wrap this synopsis up, and Leslie cheerfully greets them. Ben returns to apologize to Leslie for leaving, admitting that he's not over his past yet. She reassures him the festival is as much his accomplishment as hers, and ha- even has Ken break Ben's curse, although Ken's gesture is also completely meaningless. Just a joke. At the end, Ben appears to have been won over by Lil Sebastian, but then admits to the camera crew that he still fails to see the appeal and remains as baffled as ever. Um, really cute ending. 
Very cute ending. I also, um, speaking of direction, Parks and Rec is a lot of things. Wonderful, wonderful things of which we have based a podcast on. But one of the things it is not is a show of tremendous scope and scale. And I almost fell out of my chair when I saw a drone shot, an yeah. overhead helicopter shot of of the entire you know the, the 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 festival and the city and the sunset and it was glorious and beautiful I'm like wait a minute what show am i watching here <laughs> it you're absolutely right because we would joke a lot for those of you who who know a little bit about shooting the show like there's no dollies there's no steady cam there's no you know you would never people would never be laying down track to put a dolly on to put a camera to move it like and 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 so to suddenly go from that it's 100% handheld like super easy to light, super, you know, wide open apertures and, and it's sort of like the irises or, you know, whatever. You, you get it. And, and, and then at the end of this episode, a couple things, not just that drone shot. The show basically never uses music. It almost never uses either non-diegetic, sometimes diegetic music, which is music that's in the story of the show. But this is an actual song that is played over the end of this episode. Mike agonized over this, and he asked the writing staff a few times, like, should he use the music at the end? And he ended up using it. It's kind of cool. It's it's American Girl by Tom Petty. But it's it's like that paired with a drone shot, it's crazy. It's like it's one of the craziest things. And Mike said, at the time, it was the most expensive shot of the entire series. Because it was both that drone, and I believe, I think this was a real helicopter. I'm not sure if it was two drone shots or a drone and then a helicopter. I couldn't tell. But then there's also a ton of VFX. Because they put in like a, a roller coaster and like the, a Sweetums tent. You know, it's not the most expensive VFX in the world. If you watch this shot now, 10 years later. But there's still some shots in like an NBC sitcom. So there's still some VFX shots, which is like, that's really tough to do, by the way, on this kind of schedule and on this kind of budget. It's it's tough to do that. Uh, having dealt a little bit with VFX uh, now, it, it's, it, man, it, it's tough to do. Um, but yeah, it was worth it. And did Tom you enjoy Pe the shot? Did you, did you think I it was loved good? It. I loved it. And Tom Petty ain't cheap either. That's right. That's right. I mean, the, well, I will say this. The music budget for Parks and Rec must have been vanishingly small. So maybe they amortized that song over the course of 125 episodes. That's they right. They never used any other songs. So that's that's very funny. Because so you know to pay to, to use a song, you have to pay the the publishing and, and the songwriters and everyone. It's extremely expensive. I so, promise you that song was between fifty and seventy five thousand dollars, if not more. Yeah, if not maybe more. more. I, I, we're doing a lot of music clearances now. Um, we had someone quote us two hundred grand for a song. Mm -hmm. We didn't. We didn't use it. But yeah, I mean, Wait, that, I'm, I, I, I'm told here that the Drew Carey show isn't streaming because of the music in it. That that's wild. I mean, that makes sense. You have to pay for. They call it like in perpetuity, and they call it like you know different. You get diff you pay for different levels of rights. You know, so sometimes I believe this happened with Freaks and Geeks. They had to go in meticulously and replace some of the songs that they couldn't clear for you know streaming or, or DVD or whatever. But it's a pain, man. It's like a you really you really fall in love. We're doing a lot of music on on the new show I'm working on. It's a ton of music. It's all like late '90s, early 2000s hip hop. So it's like you know Biggie and Diddy mm -hmm. and, and Mace and Lil Kim, and it's like it's great i'm really happy but it's also just impossible to clear <laughs> because it's like you know what like this diddy song has a david bowie sample it's like can you get david bowie's estate to clear like this is insane this is wow. like this is just a, 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 it's a it's a it's a quagmire it's uh, crazy to watch some shows on streaming now and like i think of dawson's creek that has that amazing cut to like the paula cole song like i don't want to wait and i just think of the record it's not it's a new song and oh, so you just no. you're like ready for that moment like i like injected into my veins kind of a thing and it's yeah. just this like lovely little thing that's this is not the show i know what do you um i i, I want to also just point out something about that overhead shot which i think is worth talking about which is that we rarely because it's a mockumentary get to see pawnee from this vantage point and besides it being fun to see the you know the um enormous like version of this harvest festival um but it kind of reminded me that oh this is like a city right where people need to find activities on the weekends and where people live and work and you get to see streets around it as opposed to this more myopic view of like the library or right a park and i think it was nice it kind of reminded me again of like what we talked about in the room of Pawnee being like this live action version of springfield right that 
everything exists together. And of course, Sweetums is sponsoring something. So to me, it had this lovely encapsulation of the Pony we've come to know for the last few years. I also like that it it it's it proves that old thing is that rules are meant to be broken. Yeah, and because there's a world where we just talked about it, Alan, where Mike agonized. He's like, "We're we're not that show that ends every show with a needle drop pop hit. That's not what we do. Should we do it? You did it. It's great." He's like, "We don't do overhead drone shots because it's not the point of view of a mockumentary. What are the mockumentary guys up in the helicopter? No. Okay, so how are you getting that? You broke the, you broke a rule of making the show, and it's great. Nobody cares. It's awesome. Yeah." And I feel like one of the things I contributed to that was I think, you know, I think they were rightfully proud of having gotten to this point. You know, the show built and built and built and got better and better and added new and improved cast members and all this stuff. And and, and this felt like a, a like a huge achievement, I think, for us. I think it felt like, you know, wow, we, we kind of got over the hump and figured out what the show was. And it, God, it's clicking. It's fun. It's like all of these actors are amazing. It's you know, it's just really firing in all cylinders. I'm like, yeah, let's do a little helicopter shot and 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 and, and yeah, kind of take a, a victory fast in the glory for a second. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And 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 then you know, go on with the rest of the season. And you, you and know keep where in else? Mind, do you know where yeah, else they take victory laps? Where? Ford v Ferrari. Ford v. I mean, that's it's really like Ford v. Ford v Ferrari. I, I we should do a whole episode on Ford v. I actually have some thoughts on Ford v Ferrari. It's good. I yeah. I just have some thoughts on it, but yeah, it's it's good. I, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you watched it fresh. Yeah, I did. <laughs> How about that? Yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's go to the oops moment. Okay, so I mentioned this casually earlier. I'm kind of curious about the origin of this. Ken Otate originally said that white people like Matchbox Twenty. But later in reruns, it got changed to Rachel Ray. Why did we do that? Why did that happen? Just for fun? Did Matchbox 20 sue us? Yeah, did well, Rob that's Thomas a, from uh, Smooth sue us? They're both great jokes, I'm, but yeah. I'm curious why they changed. They're both hilarious jokes. It, it seems like we don't know why. <laughs> it seems like it just got changed. Did you not have the right? It, it's the music streaming thing. It's like, not only can you not use Matchbox 20's Music, you clearly can't say their names. You can't even say Matchbox Twenty. Is it? Did did Mike strike up a friendship with Rob Thomas, <laughs> the guys from that show or, or that band? He didn't want to. He didn't want to offend them. Anyway, I guess I, I, I'm looking at the script right now, and the script yeah. we shot said that they love Rachel Ray, um, huh. and the Trevor curses. I wonder if there was an alt. So there's a version, and in some version it had I, it, but it, I, I I am a bit mystified by this. Oops, as well. I have to tell yeah, you. Yeah, this well, this may be a false memory, but I feel like I've seen the marquee say Mar- Matchbox Twenty at the end. Like I re- literally feel like I watched a version of this episode where it said Matchbox Twenty. Let's write in. I, I, I don't know if this is a Berenstain Bears moment. I guess there's no way to really know because it's all the versions now will be Rachel Ray. So um, unless someone has a VHS recording from uh, 2012 or whenever this year, <laughs> 2011. It's on my, uh, what is it? What was the original DVR thing? TiVo. 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 Yes. I love the noises that blip, TiVo oh, would make. Blip, blip. Blip. That was one of the, the first sound effects in the room. So satisfying. Yeah. Wasn't it satisfying? Wasn't it? <laughs> like, I would love to just, that, I would love to add that to and my we TV literally now. said it was, it was like that phrase that like, yeah, I'm going to TiVo it. It was, yeah. a, it was a thing. Now, do you think the owners of TiVo like kicked themselves? Got to sell? Well, or did they sell, do you think? Or did they get acquired and make some money? Or did they just get booted out of the business? Or, or are they just the, the other version of BlackBerry? Who had the world at their feet and then just just fiddled while Rome burned? You know what I like to record on my TiVo, Ray Donovan. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. Episode MVP, most valuable Pawnee, and which character moment sticks out at you? Oh, oh, yeah. this is a no. Nope, this right, isn't even a, this isn't even a conversation. One, two, three. Little Sebastian. Little Sebastian. Sebastian. <laughs> Little yeah. Sebastian. If you say anything else, you're not a true Pawnee, and you're not That's a real right. fan. That's right. <laughs> you're not anyone else, but. If you want to let you let us know another MVP or a different MVP for a different episode, tweet us at Team Coco Podcast or by using the hashtag Parks and Recollection. So, you know, we all know the real MVP of this episode. You can give us the runner up. Like, why don't we do that? The runner up for this episode. Runner up MVP for yep. uh, Harvest Festival because we all know the, the, the winner is Little Sebastian, uh, the most adorable horse in the world. Um, shall we do the town hall? Let's do it. I 
I think we do the town hall from the Sweetums tent at the Harvest Festival where we're doing it. I know it's a little hot in that tent. The ventilation oh, is true. not good. <laughs> Maybe we do it in the corn maze where Jerry's like uh, corn still maze. eating corn to stay away, <laughs> to, to right. stay alive. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, let's do it in the corn maze. Uh, hopefully, we can make our way out after we answer this question yeah. from Matt from Australia, all the way down under. I love it. Uh, I'll spare you my Australian accent. This is literally my favorite pod, he says. And favorite is spelled F-A-V-O-U-R-I-T-E. So he's really not lying about being Australian. Well, there's, another, question, there's another dead giveaway coming up. Keep keep reading. My question. Since the show was left the telly, Bingo. he says. <laughs> okay, now I feel like you're pushing too hard. Maybe you're not Australian. Good. Matt from Australia asks, since the show was left the telly, are there any real world inspired story beats you'd love to explore if the show was still running? Mm. Second question. I think something... Pokemon Go inspired would be fun. Oh, would yeah. Chris play Pokemon? The parks here were flooded with peeps during that time. I love this question. I would this would is amazing. Chris play Pokemon Go? Pokemon Are you Go. kidding? He'd be in a league. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Pokemon Go. I, I, and I would love to see you on Wednesday, but that is the night I, I meet with my Pokemon Go league. I have to hatch another egg. I have one that's 50 kilometers. <laughs> it's, like, it's, it's just, Ooh, it's just, I just hatched an egg. I just hatched an egg. <laughs> <laughs> it's a Clefairy. <laughs> it's, 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 he's Ooh. like, he's like another Jigglypuff. <laughs> Ooh, it's just, a Spritel. He just, I mean, it's, I just a quick story about Pokemon God. So Pokemon God was a phenomenon how many years ago? Like that's five to seven. <laughs> Yeah, it's got to be like five years ago, right? Oh, I mean, yeah. it's got to be at least. So so I played for, I actually did play for a little bit. I love walking around, right? So I love, you know, just getting my steps in. Got to yep. get, you know, six, seven miles a day, right? You want to get, okay, since so 2016, so six years ago. Um, so I played Pokemon Go for a while. Like every, like I feel like it was a fad that went around. People played for like a month. Like I played for like a month. My sister still playing Pokemon Go. So when, when we go anywhere, <laughs> I see her take out her phone. She has kids. She's like a grown woman. She's a lawyer, very successful person. Just like taking out her phone, playing Pokemon Go. So you know she's like got so many Pokemon. And the other thing is my my friend's husband still plays. So like there's still like a secret society of some <laughs> Pokemon Go people still going. And they're just still like they're, she's traveling. She's like, I'm in uh, I'm in Bora Bora. There's some interesting Pokemon. You're like, there's Pokemon <laughs> in Bora Bora or wherever they are. Like it's, it's amazing. very funny to me that that they're playing. I think Pokemon Go is a good idea. Um Boy, I mean, I think this, I think we feel lucky in a way that some of this stuff got avoided, but like, you know, I feel like there's social, there's a lot of social media bits. Like, I know we did near the end of our run, we did some tweets. I think Tom, Tom had a, a, a Twitter story, but I think that's like very ripe for, uh, mm. and, and then I don't know. I think things got a little dark in America. So I <laughs> feel like maybe we it's good. Like, I don't want to do, I don't honestly really want to do like election or pandemic stories. So maybe it's good we got out while we did. Pokemon Go, though, is a good answer. That's that's very nice and light. It's very yeah. cheerful. And Chris would love it. That is, he would love it. Dude, he would be the world champion. He would oh, have God. one from every fucking Running? Topic. Well, just think how fast he'd run around. Exactly. Get just hatching eggs like a motherfucker. I love it. I'm busy um, hatching eggs. <laughs> Uh, all right. I love it. Thank you, Matt, from Australia. We are departing the town hall. Any other last comments, to, uh, Rob? I just want to thank everybody for listening, as always. And don't forget to subscribe. Uh, that's very important. You want to get everything here. You know, there's a lot of good stuff to come. Uh, so wherever you get your podcast and uh, five-star reviews on Apple. And uh, as always, thanks to Schulte and Greg. Uh, another great episode. And uh, I'm going to go play Pokemon Go. That's what I'm going to go do right now. I've been inspired. I love it. Goodbye from Pawnee. See you next week. Parks and Recollection is produced by Greg Levine and me, Rob Schulte. Our coordinating producer is Lisa Berm. The podcast is executive produced by Alan Yang for Alan Yang Productions, Rob Lowe for Low Profile, Jeff Ross, Adam Sachs, and Joanna Solitaroff at Team Coco, and Colin Anderson at Stitcher. Gina Batista, Paula Davis, and Britt Kahn are our talent bookers. The theme song is by Mouse Rat, a.k.a. Mark Rivers, with additional tracks composed by John Danik. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time on Parks and Recollection. This has been a Team Coco production in association with Stitcher. Stitcher.